You're listening to the Southampton Delivery po- po- Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans. <laughs> If you want to have guarantees, you have to buy a washing machine. Okay, with a stupid head in We don't lose a match, either we win or we learn. And today we learn. Abdacha, Hostin! Shot at Gizabi! It's in field to Mare, 25 yards out. Lovely ball for Pella. Onside, 1-0! Blue foul shot! Like Bambi on ice. It would be very, very embarrassing to watch. And now, and now, now. Your, host, your host, Matt Markstone. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast, a podcast and newsletter dedicated to the Southampton Football Club and all of the SFC fans, and available right here on SouthamptonDelivery.com. My name is Matt Markstone. I am the host of the show. No matter where you are, no matter how you may be listening, whether this is your first time or you've been here before, thanks for making the show part of your day. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope that you and your family are doing well. This time is of course trying. And uh, since we have recorded the show, but before it comes out, um, some news came out that a a fellow saints fan, Mark Shannon uh, has passed away from the coronavirus, And that, I mean, it is, it is already real for a lot of us. And, you know, I didn't know Mark personally, Um, but the fact that we've lost one of our own fans, um, is just one of the many thousands from around the world. Um, but this is a a real thing. Uh, my thoughts and I'm sure your thoughts and all of our thoughts go out to, to his family, to his partner, to his child. Um, just hope that they are all, uh, doing okay. And as difficult as it is for, I'm sure them right now. And, you know, hopefully just for those of us, I mean, Tom Mason, who joins the show this week, uh, and I, we, you know, during the sh- course of the show, we we complain about some things that we're dealing with in terms of, um, you know, having to to stay home and not having sports and all of those other things, and really, uh, it all means nothing. Uh, the 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 reality of the situation is that that people are ill, that people are losing their lives, and um, if as, as Tom and I will mention during the show. If we don't have football because people need to stay safe, like that is that is ultimately the most important thing. But um, as I said, Tom is on the show, and there is no good transition to to happier times from that. But uh, if you want to follow Tom on Instagram, you can do that. He's at T Mason nineteen. He's also on Twitter at Tom underscore Mason eighteen. Uh, we'll talk about everything from the Portsmouth match, which he was at, to uh, you know, kind of what should happen with the rest of the season players that may or may not come back players that are on loan, things like that. Uh, we'll answer some listener questions. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we just tried to have a good time. We talked on uh, early Saturday morning. Um, so I hope that, uh, it, yeah, I hope you enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. Um, if you, if you are enjoying the show, um, leave a review or rate it. If you have some extra time, uh, if you don't enjoy the show, then by all means, uh, skip that part of it because, uh, you know, the good ratings help the bad ratings also help, but they don't help me. Hope that makes sense. Also, the dog won't bark this week because his jaw's broken, but I didn't do it. So uh, here we go. We'd like to welcome back to the Southampton Delivery Podcast, Tom Mason. You can find him on Instagram at tmaso19 and on Twitter at tom underscore mason18. Tom, welcome back to the show, even though, as I've said for the past couple of weeks, it seems like forever. Uh, there's no football necessarily to talk about, but uh, nice to catch up with you a little bit, and uh, I hope you're doing all right. Yeah, it's great to back on. Cheers, Matt. Um, nice to be able to contribute to the podcast in this sort of difficult and uncertain times, but hopefully if people keep continuing to listen to the, the guidelines in everyone's respective countries. We can be back doing what we love doing every week and supporting Saints um, and just getting back to normal, really. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's a, it's a weird time for everybody, and it's everybody's responding a little bit differently, even though it's kind of all, you know, most of our countries are, are, are reacting the same way, unless you're in Sweden or, or Germany, where maybe you have the, the prospect of being able to watch football soon. But uh, for the most part, we're, we're just at home, you know, staying home, not going out and, and kind of, uh, you know, just, just doing that stuff. And uh, I feel very fortunate that we have, you know, I have people in the house. I have a place I can go and walk and be outside. And uh, I have friends and stuff. We were talking before that, 
live in, you know, either they live in a city or they live in like a one bedroom apartment. It's just them with nobody else. And I can't imagine uh, how that, how that works at a time like this. Oh, I can't imagine it. It must be difficult for a lot of people, uh, particularly in like built up cities and people in houses with like six, seven, eight people it must be really difficult. So I'm really quite fortunate and grateful for where I do live at the moment. And, um, yeah, it's just difficult, but, um, like you say, if people stick to guidelines and the, what the government are saying, then hopefully we'll be back out of this situation as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, and you are pretty much done with with uni. Uh, so hopefully your graduation goes ahead um, in in later this year, November, um, without a without a hitch. But if not, um, you know, happy graduation and congratulations on on being done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm quite lucky in the sense that ours was November anyway, scheduled. So a lot of my mates met at Brighton Uni. He's, his graduation has been cancelled already. It was in July, so I've, I've been really fortunate in that to trip that instance. Yeah, yeah I've nearly done um, three years worth of work, and I've got a few, a few more assessments left to do, and I'll be all done and looking for jobs in the sports media industry. Yeah, well, if anybody's listening, hire hire you, right? Like, you know, I yeah, hope, yeah, uh, right. hope you got something going on. I mean, and you were working um, in in uni, you know, doing some journalism stuff too. So, like, it's not like you don't have yeah. experience. Oh yeah, I've got. I've got plenty of experience. I've been covering Bristol Rovers who play in the same league as Portsmouth in League One. Um, I was actually going to be going back to Fratton Park supposed to be in April, but obviously because of what's happening, that hasn't, that hasn't materialised. But yeah, I've been, been doing the majority of their home games and the occasional away games. So it's been, been really good. And last year I did covered a non-league team uh, pretty much the whole season and they got, got promoted. So I've had a wide range of experiences in a number of different sports as well, not just football. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's it been like covering, covering a team in league one? I mean, that's, that's a fully, I mean, making the jump from kind of non-league coverage to fully, a fully professional team. Uh, what's that? Has there been a big difference between the two in terms of, of just what you've seen, um, you know, just interacting with the team kind of week in, week out? Yeah. Massive difference. Uh, the first one, Yates town in Bristol. Um, I was doing a lot of, it wasn't for the club itself. It was for like a newspaper. I was going down every week, every home game. Uh, writing match reports, speaking to the manager after, and I could literally speak to the manager easily whenever I wanted to. Like no issue at all. No internet at the press box. I had to use I had to use 3G. Not well, even the press box really, but I use 3G, 4G. Um, so that was that was challenging sometimes, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed that and it helped me get to the to the next role really. Um, but this year has been really good. It's given me a solid basis to move forward with, and I don't know. It's just it's obviously a professional game, so it's a lot more I don't know you, you see more technically from the side of the football game rather than like tackles flying in non-league and putting more goals in non-league so I just think it's a bit a bit higher standard and it's nice just to be able to, to watch certain players that you've you've watched over the years that maybe come to the end of their careers that sort of finishing now so that's been quite interesting as well you've obviously been home for some time now and, and football hasn't been played for a while but I mean do you have any any idea how this has been affecting Bristol Rovers, them being a team in League One that doesn't maybe have Premier League TV money and things like that? Like, I know that the championship takes like 80% of the, the EFL money, and mm. I think it's 12% to League League One and then 8% to League Two. So they're operating on a much smaller budget, and, and this has got to be a, a definitely a difficult time for them in terms of, of finances and, and things like that. Yeah, so I know that they've followed their staff, which if people don't know from listening from abroad and stuff, it's some which the UK government have done in the UK where they will basically cover 80% of all wages up until maybe three months, four months. That sort of helps secure the future of the playing staff and the non-playing staff of the club. But I think a lot of League One clubs and League Two and below will be struggling massively through this period. No income through even like the tickets and the people inside the ground buying like Cokes and pasties and stuff like that. Yeah. They're going to be really affected by it and hopefully they can just get through it. Unfortunately, I do think there will be, maybe not Bristol, but I think there will be a few clubs that will go through sort of the roof and won't be able to continue because it's just it's such a hard imp- with financial implication on them. Like you saw Barry last year go, Bolton were very close to going as well. So it's just very difficult and hopefully all, all these clubs can pull through. Yeah, and, and you see some of these clubs that, that have gone out of business you know, beforehand, and sometimes it's it's due to, to mismanagement and and poor ownership and things like that. And then you have clubs that are being run what you would call the right way. And and one of the things mm-hmm. that I've learned during this time is 
is that these these clubs, even though they have all of this money going in, that like they're all operating kind of almost hand to mouth. A lot of a lot of teams don't have big cash reserves. They can't afford to 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 pay everybody all the time going forward without income coming in. And and it just it blows my mind a little bit that there's so much money in the game that we have clubs like this, but at the same time, like if you know, when you get a raise, you tend to spend that money. You don't tend to just be you know, to add to your, to your savings as much as, as maybe you should. And it's, 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 uh, it's really sad to see all the, the teams kind of going through this and some of the teams that are being run the right way that just, that just aren't, like you said, may not have the, the ability to operate after this. And that's, I think that's going to be a really, uh, that's a big deal because you're not just losing uh, a club in the football pyramid. You're not just losing one of the 92, you're losing, you know, big parts of communities that, that people uh, are attached to. And, you know, Southampton has been around since, the late 1800s, like if they were to go like Southampton itself would suffer um, massively in terms of not just financially, but just there'd be a giant hole in the kind of the, the fabric of the city after that, you know? Yeah. hundred percent agree. And I, I don't clubs like Man United, Man City, Liverpool, and, and huge amounts of money. I just don't get why they can't go and help like the likes of Bolton and Mansfield, Macclesfield who have been struggling in the lower leagues. Like that is something I don't get, but it's, so obviously, maybe it's more challenging to do to work out like, paperwork wise, but I, I think teams will struggle massively. And um, like you say, with cities in particular, if Saints or someone like that were to go bust, obviously we nearly saw it a few years ago. We went into administration. It's just it's hard to imagine, really. I've been following the club for such a long time, and then it's just gone in an instance. Like it's just, it's just very hard. And I know Barry are trying to get back, but they're going to have to start right from the bottom so it's just a real challenge really for everyone involved yeah yeah it's it i i don't know i don't know what 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 would happen if that were to i mean honestly if, if that if that were to happen and i don't really want to think about it that much but like mm. i it might just be the end of i i just may not support anybody ever like i just i might yeah. watch but that would be it you know i just watch the sport now just and mm. i don't know it'd be difficult to do I'd this find podcast it very hard. <laughs> i'd find it very hard to for anyone else, to be honest. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to be a neutral. I think for every every game, I just wouldn't. Maybe like a local team to Samson in the non-league, maybe like East or something like that. On, but I just I just couldn't couldn't tend to bring myself to support someone else having supported them for the amount of time I have now. Well, let's let's not think about that. <laughs> that's that's gonna put a, a sour note on the on the show, and we don't we don't need to do that necessarily. Um, but I mean, it sounds like you're coping with the lockdown you know, all right, as much as, as, as well as we can. Um, but I mean, saints are doing stuff in terms of, you know, trying to give us uh, as content. We've talked about it over the last couple of weeks and I hate that word content, but, uh, I said it there, but, uh, saints have been, you know, replaying matches and things like that. And this week they, uh, you know, I don't want to say they, they replayed the big one, but, uh, it gave us a chance to, to relive the, uh, the away win over Portsmouth, uh, this, this season. And, and you, had your trip to to Fratton Park, and I just want to kind of talk to you a little bit about about that night and and the fact that you hadn't been there before. Uh, so going down there, I mean, what was your, I mean, what what, what was what was it like leading up to like that day? What were your feelings kind of going into that match in terms of uh, just just going down to Portsmouth and being involved in something that was with the police presence and kind of all the build up and everything else? What was your kind of feeling leading up to that? It was quite a surreal experience, really, when the draw came out. I couldn't quite believe it. The first derby since 2011-12 season. Um, my first chance to go to Fratton Park. It was just incredible. I wasn't going to turn down that opportunity. and It was just amazing, really. And I travelled down. I drove down and then got a train to the well, from South Central to, to Fratton. And it was full of ports of fans. And with, a mate, with a mate Dan, and he, he was sat with me. And then... We had to sort of keep a little bit quiet so we didn't cause, didn't have any, too many issues because I didn't want to miss the game, that was for sure. And um, once we got there, it was just incredible, really. Like, the amount of police presence and just general atmosphere around the ground. And we, we made just about make kickoff. It was crazy how busy it was trying to get in. And the, the stewards weren't very helpful at all trying to get you in. So um, it's incredible. And the game itself was just different level. One of the, my favourite games I've ever been to, I think. And, for Danny Ings to get two of the goals and be a Saints fan at heart and just incredible and obviously the next round we, we lost the City but as far as I'm concerned that didn't matter we won the biggest game of the season 
Yeah. Had you ever experienced anything like that in terms of, of the buildup and in, in uh, the police presence and things like that? Did you ever cover a game like that maybe? Um, or, or was this kind of the, the biggest and, and most kind of unique in that, in that, in terms of that? Um, not really. It's probably the biggest. I haven't really ever been to many derbies at all. Like, not even like a, a League One derby, really. Um, League Two. Um, maybe Forest Green Cheltenham, but that's sort of, that's sort of League Two and it's, it's sort of a growing rivalry, whereas this is obviously more of an established one going back all the way to the, to the wartime. Um, so yeah, I hadn't really experienced it before and just the sheer number of police and emergency services that were there was just incredible. And, I saw the thing that uh, I think it was Copper 90 did with the Derby days, and that was just made you realise just how big a Derby was. Because I don't think many people away from the two clubs think it's a big Derby, but that that night made me realise just how big it is. Yeah, and, and the the Copa 90 story, they did a they did they did a great job in terms of mm-hmm. I think getting, um, you know, both sides of it, and and uh, you know, for me, well, I think one of the things that was most illuminating is when you see who they talk to, you know, in terms of Southampton. Um, the the fans and and people like that you you recognize some of them from their work around and it's like hey those are you know they didn't pick these weird kind of <laughs> people they picked kind of the normal uh, fans that we kind of interact with uh, quite often and uh, which I appreciated uh, of course you can't say that about the Portsmouth fans because they all <laughs> they're all a bit weird um, but hey, you know it, it is what it is but I mean on the evening or on the day it was obviously it was just a fantastic time there was a couple of nervy moments you know from the start though like we didn't we didn't necessarily start the game all that well oh no first half they were first sort of 20 minutes they were they were well on top they probably should have scored to be honest mm-hmm. um if they had the scored, it would have right? been complete hit the post yeah they had a good somehow didn't score from a corner mccarthy just scrambled it away they, how they didn't score i don't know but if they had a scored in the first half first 20 minutes before we did that would have been a completely different game and it would have been a tough to, to come back from in all honesty and um Luckily, Ings got the goal, and back from there, we didn't really look back and sort of torn them apart, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember having to, um, it was at school that day, so we were in a meeting. I couldn't really watch the game, so I shut off my phone just completely. Um, so yeah. no no notifications, no anything, and it just, you know, ran home basically like a little kid, um, put the TV on and just sat down, and I could not have been more nervous. I don't think I've... Um, I don't think I've been more nervous before a match just to watch uh, other than sometimes I get nervous watching my kids play, but like watching that just uh, my heart was racing kind of the whole time. And when they hit the post, I, I said a lot of, of things that I, my kids probably wish they wouldn't have heard, but um, you know, in oh, the end, so obviously we, we go out for no winners and um, you, you, you have that over them. And, and like you said, for Ings to score um, the, the knee slides, uh, you know, both of them. And then, uh, it's just the whole the whole night was a uh, pretty pretty magical from my from just watching. I can't imagine what it would have been like to uh, to to have been there. It was just incredible. Like the, the atmosphere in the away end was was just incredible. There was quite a few people who didn't have tickets that had managed to get into the away end somehow. Um, that made even more fans in, in there as they should have been. And um, yeah, it was just incredible. And like I said earlier, they they should have been winning um, in the first sort of twenty twenty five minutes. So. Um, come back and, and win and sort of get our own back from the 4-1 sort of defeat we had against them when the roles were reversed. We were in League One, they were in the Premiership quite a few years ago now, I think it was 2008 or something. And um, it was just incredible. And if we had lost that game, we would not have had the end of it. And we would have just been the banter team the whole season, having lost to Leicester. Obviously, I hadn't come by that point, but having lost to Leicester as well, if we had lost to Pompey in the same season, it would have just been horrendous. Yeah. And... Um... I mean, it's really a no-win situation that draw because if you win, you should win. You know, that's uh, a team several divisions below you. Uh, you know, wage differences and everything else. So like, there you you should be winning that match. And if you lose, then you've just lost to a team that is that is so far below you that there's that's that's embarrassing. You know, and it is. Um, God, it's 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 a bit of a, a no-win situation. But I think really the way we went about it and kind of once we scored and established control, we had another chance and the, you know, they came up with a, a, a pretty good, uh, I want to say double save to, to kind of keep it um, at one nil for a while. Uh, but eventually, obviously the, the quality just, just showed through and uh, yeah, I mean, we kind of, everybody leaves with a smile. Like you said, we, we lose the city the next round, but like it's, it, it, 
the 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 big game was won, and uh, and anything after that is just a bonus. Yeah, I'm certainly agree. I couldn't believe it when I saw the draw, having beaten beaten Pompey, we we get City, like, the hardest draw you can get. Probably maybe bar Liverpool, who make a lot of changes in the cup. I know it probably was the hardest draw. Just couldn't believe it, but like you say, the, the big job was done, and we managed to, to beat them. And I think it was the first time we won there in 40 years or something. Yeah, it's so been it, a while. it was it was a big night, big big sort of morale boost, and nice to quiet and quiet down a few uh, few Pompey fans. Yeah, well, what was it like uh, trying to exit the, the stadium in terms of getting back to the train station? No, any issues that you remember from that night? I saw a couple of fans had a bit of trouble with like a few pump fans and stuff, but we were stuck on the ground for ages after. It was a good hour. Like they made they made us stay on the ground, and so pump fans could all go and get on the trains and stuff. And then when we were eventually allowed out, um, it was basically a whole Saint, whole of Saints fans get, that were getting the train brought on an escort, police escort. The station, which was about 10, 15 minute walk, it obviously took a lot longer because they were doing an escort. So, um, so that was interesting and an experience to say the least. And we eventually got back to Sample Central, I think it was about 12 ish, something like that. And then we drove drove back, and then, yeah, next day, just couldn't believe it again. It's just one of the days I'll never forget, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of along. A- a those lines in terms of, I mean, Saints obviously choosing to show that, that there's, there's a little bit of, you know, there, there's a reason behind that one. We Mm -hmm. get to watch that match again and we get to establish that once again, we, we beat you at your place. And, and uh, I don't think any Saints fans going to complain about that game being shown again in in full. Um, But are there, I mean, are there other matches from this season that you would say, like, I wouldn't mind watching that, that thing again? For me, it's maybe not like a big, big win as in terms of scoreline, but, I think the Spurs went at home. That was just incredible for me. It was, I think it was, was it New Year's Day or the 2nd of January? Um, yeah, something like that. Something on that. Um, things scored after, what, 10, 11 minutes? And we, were, we weren't even holding on, really. We were just in control. We probably should have put them to bed a lot earlier than we did. Kane, I think Kane went off injured uh, with the hamstring. He's still played since. Son was out, which was a big boost anyway. And um, yeah, that's one of my favourite wins. In terms of another away game, uh, it's a tough one. We haven't had huge, huge amounts of away games, but that I, that I like that we've had. Um, I, like, I like the Chelsea win and the Leicester win. Mm-hmm. I think they were both really good, but one that I went to was Palace. Again, another ground I'd never been to. I reckon was always been quite good at Palace in recent years, so um, I was confident we'd win, and again, we just sort of played off the park and easily won 2-0. Um, that, that's been my favourite that I've been to in the league as an away game this season. I'd say probably just thinking about other matches that I would want to to see, and I mean, obviously we know the the Leicester scoreline at home, but I think mm. for us to go there and and win, I thought that was a really a good performance from us. I would I would like to to see that again. But the the Chelsea win, I, kind of the wins that we have this season, they've all you, you you'd watch almost any of them again because we haven't had yeah. wins, you know, in the past couple of years, and they haven't been plentiful, but. Um, I even watched the first half of the uh, of the Wolves match again because we I thought we played oh, really yeah. well then, you know, but uh, just kind of fell apart in the second half. But I mean, at this point, whatever Southampton wants to put on, we'll watch. I think I think we're getting to yeah. that point, you know. No doubt, yeah. It's exactly fans will watch anything as long as it's a positive thing. Um, even even stuff from say like the promotion days, that that thing, maybe like the four nil would be Coventry to secure promotion, mm-hmm. maybe one like that or. Even further back, one with Matt Fizz. I don't know if they have the footage properly or stuff like that, but maybe, yeah, it's, it's, there's plenty of games they could choose to do the same thing. Yeah, I don't know how the rights issues work in terms of, of when they're allowed to start showing stuff and full matches and things, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I hopefully we'll continue to get uh, continue to get to get matches and be able to sit down and kind of just enjoy them because it's uh, <laughs> it's just nice to be able to sit down and do, enjoy some actual football, um, especially if they're they're the good times. We could avoid just anything or most things from the Claude Puel season. I'd I'd watch that uh, EFL Cup semi final uh, again, mm. even though there's only one yeah, goal in it. Well. But uh, yeah, just that night was uh, another another good night. So you know, th- there you go. Um, but I, I guess it kind of you know obviously that it seems like so long ago that that we played Portsmouth, even though it was just earlier this season. But the season now, uh, football is getting further and further away, and and different places are different doing different things in terms of how the the season is going to to kind of progress but i think the most important thing is i I would like to see fans in the stadium uh up to a point you know um but 
we do have a, a question, and I don't normally go to questions this early, but he kind of goes to what we want to talk about. It says, uh, from Kevin McGee, one of the patrons of the show, says, there may be no large gatherings allowed for the rest of the year, so would you rather see football behind closed doors or not played at all? And uh, for you, I guess, what's your what would be your preference in terms of uh, getting football started earlier just without fans or, or waiting till kind of we can do it uh, with everybody in the stadium? I'd, I'd want to get football back beyond closed, if we can get beyond closed doors, but I just don't see a way that it's possible until we get a vaccination for the virus. Um, you're still going to have two, 300 people at, at grounds. Even if you are beyond closed doors, you've got all the medical staff, probably TV crews, you've got the playing staff, obviously, ambulance staff that would need to be there. It's, it's just not going to work unless the virus has gone completely. So I just don't see a way you can return to playing football unless it's gone completely. I, I just don't see it will work. And the minute one person picks up something, even if it's just a, a medical staff or something like that, you just can't play. You can't play. You've just got to stop it. So I just, I don't see a way that you can safely play the rest of the season. For me, you've just got to got to get rid of it, avoid it. As sad as that is for so many clubs like Liverpool, Leeds, West Brom, Coventry in League One, Plymouth threw up their own League Two. It's just it's harsh, but no one expected to, to come, and it's just a, a, a one-off. Hopefully, and hopefully we can back to normal soon. But I just don't see a way that the season can be finished safely. Yeah, I think kind of the only reason I would say. It's difficult because I would like I would like it to go back to normal, and that means mm. fans in the stands and everything else. And that might be I mean we don't have it really a timeline for for when that will be able to happen. And so to to kind of just say I I want it I want it back that way, and I'll be I'm willing to wait. Like I don't know if I'm willing to wait because I don't know if a year from now if I'm going to be like yeah you know we we you know I'll wait for football that long. And like we said you know fi- financially like that you're going to run into a lot of issues. And I, I guess the only thing I'm I'm worried about at this point would be, you know, the, the TV money and the, there are contracts with vendors and everything else that have to be fulfilled. And you, you would hope they would understand, but at some point you're just passing the loss of money all the way down the line. And, it, and eventually that money has to, has to come from somewhere. And, you know, if those guys aren't getting paid and, and they can't fulfill their, their obligations, then, then who knows what kind of how far this goes. But, um, you just hope that everybody can kind of come to some, find some agreement, some common ground that, you know, this wasn't planned. We're not doing this just to, to try to avoid contracts or anything like that. Like this is just a really an unprecedented situation and we need to take some steps that, that, uh, that would, I guess, try to rectify the situation, even though I'm not sure I, I understand kind of maybe all the ins and outs of it as it is. But, um, my preference would be put, put fans in the stands before we see football back. But I, oh, yeah. I'm not. Uh, I totally agree. I don't know. I don't know how that happens. A lot of footballers as well have said like, they usually have to have something to aim for, whether it's pre-season or World Cups, Euros, whatever. This year, they, this time, they haven't got anything to aim for, so they haven't got like a, a schedule. Well, yeah, we, we'll be back in June, we're back in July. You literally just don't know. And when they do set a date to come back, whether that's July, August, whatever, players are going to need a, a decent amount of time to get back to full training at least three, four weeks. So that's another impact you're going to have. You're going to, how are you going to have groups of 25, 30 people? There's no vaccination for the, for the virus. I just, I just don't see a way it can, can finish, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I, and I know that they released some, some ideas of, of what they're having the guys do at home and, and try to replicate the schedule and things like that. But I think anybody who's ever played a sport can attest that you can do all the stuff you want individually but as soon as you get around other people, that means that, you know, the intensity goes up because there's the competition that's, that's between somebody else that's pushing you, you know? Um, and I can, I can train all I want during the week and, and run sprints and everything else and, you know, be absolutely exhausted by the end of it. But as soon as I get to a game on Saturday, like there's something different there because of just because of the competition. And so um, as much as these guys are doing all of the things they can do off the pitch to kind of stay fit, um, like you said, it's going to take a while for them to get uh, fully up and ready and, and be in game shape, I guess. Yeah, it's just, it's just not the same. Like, you can do as many 10Ks, 20Ks, whatever, weight, stuff like that, but it's just not, you can play football in the garden or whatever, but you just, it's just not the same. And having had, what, we've been two, nearly two months since the last Premier League game now, so, and we're nowhere near, we're nowhere near getting back, so it's going to be at least three, three and a half, four months, which players will need at least a month to come back from. Train, so I just, 
I said it earlier, but I just don't think there's a way which we can complete the season safely because there, there needs to be a cut-off point. Like, if you haven't finished it by the end of June, for me, you've got to, you've got to avoid it because then you run into problems like contracts. A lot of players come out of contract on 30th of June. Uh, I think at the Saints, for example, Shane Long, so the Challenger Meridian, obviously in the lower leagues, they have a lot of loan players and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's not done by then, then it's got to be end of the thing. Yeah. Um, I guess we should applaud the staff because the staff are doing as much as they can at the, the club to try to keep the guys ready. And I, I don't know, man, like it, it, as weird as it is for us sitting at home, it's gotta be just as weird for them sitting at home and knowing that they still have a job to do and they have other responsibilities. And I know that, that you would think that I've been home now for a month, maybe a little longer. I, I should be able to get a lot of things done, but um, the podcast has been harder than ever to do because uh, just, you know, there is no, there's no break from, it's just kind of one long day almost. There's no, there's nothing to break up the, the time. And uh, other than mm-hmm. us watching every single Marvel movie um, mm-hmm. in order, which we're almost done, thank God. Um, watched Ant-Man and Wasp last night. It was about a four out of 10. Uh, you can skip yeah. that one probably. Um, but other than that, I thought the, the rest of them have been, have been fantastic. Um, so end, end game tonight. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, it's just, as well, like you've seen the National League, the Fifth League in England, and then below have all been voided or season ended. I just don't think you can do one thing for another, one thing for one. Like you can't have one league being off, another one voided, another one playing. I just don't think you you quite have some sort of consistency. I, I just, it's all or nothing for me. I can't give Liverpool a title if you don't relegate teams. You can't give teams Champions League places if you don't if you open places. You can't promote Leeds and West Brom. You don't rele- relegate teams. It's just it's just a horrible situation, but. Sense, yeah, and the I guess the the guidelines that came down from from UEFA didn't really address those things, right? They they because they don't care necessarily about who gets relegated and who doesn't and who gets promoted. They only care about who's going into the European places and and things like that. And they didn't tell you exactly what to do. They only said kind of they gave you some guidelines as to what not to do. Um, said it shouldn't spark controversy. It should be kind of based on merit. And it's like, well, what what do you want the leagues to do if and I understand that they're, they don't want to say exactly what every league has to do because every league's different. And, and I think no matter, no matter what you decide to do in terms of ending this season, um, you will at some point find somebody who's upset by that decision, right? Like you have, you have places yeah, yeah. where you could, you could be a point off safety, have a game in hand and a better goal difference. And all of a sudden just, you know, you're going to be relegated that, that that's a really big financial hit. That's a big hit for, for a lot of clubs and that, that, I mean, just situations like that are going to show up. Uh, up and down the table all across Europe yeah. and it's uh, it, it just gets to be a real big mess really quickly that's very similar to Villa Aston Villa they're, they're, they got a game in hand because of the Carabao Cup and they got play Sheffield United and they're two points drift with the game in hand of Bournemouth and Watford and them sort of teams and they, if they win that game in hand they'd, be, they'd, they'd move up above them all mm-hmm. so I just don't see how you can do it people talk about points per game but I just don't see how you can do that it wasn't agreed at the start of the season so I just don't see how you can, you can do that really but yeah, like you say, there's always going to be people who are upset with whatever you do. Yeah, um, unless they find a way to relegate us, I will be kind of just happy to see it move on. Um, yeah. But that's I, we're, we're fortunate to be able to be in that situation, you know? Like, to be honest, my opinion would probably be different if we were, like the last few seasons where we were right, right in it at the moment, if they were in the bottom three, I'd probably have a bit of a different opinion. Or if we were remarkably having that season, we had under Koeman where we were like six, yeah. I'd probably have a different opinion. But I guess where we're not really going to go up any places or go down so then i'm probably having a different opinion on it i mean yeah just imagine if this was us pre swansea you know a couple of yeah, couple exactly. seasons ago that the, things are a lot different um and by the way just going back to what we talked about earlier i'd watch that game again even though it was not oh. like, it was not a great game just that i just want that feeling again yeah that'd be incredible. That'd um, be incredible. i don't want the feeling that uh, jan bednarak when underwent that day though i can punch right in the face by alex mccarthy but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, nothing, nothing. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that match again. Um, well, let, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the players because we, we spoke about it a little bit last week. Um, Cedric made some headlines this week. He said he wants to, you know, he's, he's really happy at Arsenal. The guys have been really nice to him. Um, you know, he's really excited. He hopes he can make the, his contract permanent. And it's like, dude, you haven't played a match yet. What? what uh, I, I've been watching him. And I've been gauging my effort on projects. Like, is it, is it, am I giving as much effort as Cedric defending uh, a free kick at the back post? Or am I giving as much effort as Cedric training in his, his front yard uh, for Arsenal? 
because the the difference between those two things is uh, is is vast and the amount of stuff he's put out on social media lately just about um him training and stuff i'm 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 getting more and more sick of it and i realize i'm i'm picking on him um but i also don't care yeah i agree it's the best deal we ever had of him. five million and not even played for Arsenal yet like it's i know it wasn't a, a total fee but it's like a loan fee and not even played in Arsenal, Arsenal since January. I know there's been obviously because of what's happened, it would have probably would have played by now, but it'd been the first couple of months he didn't play at all. So that's just a great deal for us. And yeah, like I say, social media he's been going quite heavy lately with it all and showing us of fitness stuff. But yeah, I think it's I don't, I don't know. I don't see him being good enough for Arsenal personally, but time will tell. Yeah, if you're going to Arsenal and you're going to be Hector Bellerin's backup, like is that is that what you want to do with your career? Like exactly, yeah. that's not going to get you back in the Portugal team, you know? Um, mm. And then you just throw in the fact that he'd be behind a Spanish right back. Um, and it just makes it even worse in my opinion. Um, but yeah, he, he's only play cup games, he? yeah, yeah. I mean, that's fine. It's, it's normally where the kids play, but you, if you want to do that with your career, that's, that's, that's totally you. Um, and you know, honestly, he just may enjoy really living in London uh, and being in a big city yeah. and, and saying he plays for Arsenal, even though he doesn't really play, um, you know, it, that's just everybody's everybody's different and like he's not playing for us again so he, no, he can kind of do what he wants i guess yeah it's obviously i think his last game was palace where i get off injured but it was clear to me sort of a few months ago that he wasn't gonna have any sort of future with us long-term future with us yeah so we saw him off he was on loan valerie made a mistake against newcastle but he's always done all right when he's played and yeah, long-term vision bad boys want younger players don't they so he, he's never gonna really Especially under Ralph, not really ever going to play too much more. Um, well, I guess just kind of looking around at the squad and, and some of these players that are kind of on the on the fringes, and, and I mean, do you see this as a? I guess do you see this as an opportunity for them to to kind of gain on on those players who are already in the squad, or do you think that this is going to be more detrimental to their kind of development? Um, I think for some players, it, it could help them a little bit, give them, make them work for it even more because. By the time we sort of do return, a lot of players will have like a clean slate sort of thing. So it'll be a lot easier for them to sort of get into into the manager's plans and put a real sort of shift in and training and play for their futures. And I think a lot of the younger players will help from this because a lot of them would have been on loan and been away from the club. So I think this could really help them moving forward. I think, you know, going back to kind of how they're how they're doing the uh, the, the training away from you know keeping people away from each other and things like that and and kind of. Mm you're going to be seeing all of this kind of data. And if you could, if you're one of these players who all of a sudden is kind of jumping to the top of some of these metrics that they're seeing, you know, as you're comparing, um, you know, sprints and effort and all these other things that are kind of showing up on the, uh, in terms of data and things like that, like that might get you noticed more so than if you're just running in a pack of a bunch of, of guys up training and, and doing stuff like maybe you stand out this way and that gives you a little bit of extra, but that's only going to really benefit a couple of guys that are, that fit a specific body type and, and things like that. And, um, and I don't know, I, I think it, I think most of our, most of the players that are around are have, if they've made it this far, they're, they're good and they're, they're trying to get into the team and and now it's just going to take a, a kind of a lucky break for, for one or two of them to get the the shot. But um, I don't know. I think, I think it'll be, it's, it's gotta be tough for, for all of them, I think at this point, but, um, but yeah. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about some of these players. I mean, are there are there guys on the team that you would expect maybe with this kind of break, not knowing when it ends, that maybe their their time at, at Saints is done? Obviously, Cedric's contract runs out, Yoshida's contract runs out. They're they're gone necessarily, basically. But um, yeah, who else around the team do you think maybe uh, maybe we won't see them play again, or maybe that you would expect to to look for a move away um, as the season kind of just stagnates but maybe potentially comes to an end I think Vestergaard will, be, will go um, maybe back to Germany or something I don't think he suits the Premier League that well and um, he's one of the biggest players for us he hasn't, he hasn't done that well and he just we've sort of found a bit of a formula now with Brad Rack and Stevens so um, I think his long term future is away from the club another centre back I think Hoyt obviously has been away at Antwerp this season in Belgium um, I've always quite liked him but he made a lot of mistakes um, I don't think he will remain at the club moving forward after this pandemic's over and then I think Lamina a tough one because he's a bit, he's a bit like Popper he, on his day he can be absolutely incredible incredible and unplayable but I just don't think he'll stay so I think those will be the main three which will sort of have to come I'm afraid yeah 
I mean, would you, I guess, be willing to take a loss on some of them just to get them off the books? Or do you think we have to make some sort of, uh, because we're in the, the kind of self-sustaining model that you have to either keep them on loan somewhere uh, until you can get a, you know, a decent return for them? Or, or what, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I think given the clubs are losing a lot of money at the moment, anyway, I think you probably just have to take a loss on them, to be honest. But someone like Lamina, you probably still get decent enough value for. Maybe not as much as you've brought him for, but I think you wouldn't lose too much on him. I think Hoyt and Vestergaard is where the problem lies. Vestergaard, who paid, was it 19, 20 million? So that's, you wouldn't get anywhere near that now, I don't think. Maybe 10 at a push. Hoyt again, 8, 10 million. So maybe you're going to you're gonna have to take losses here or there because of what's going on, but... I wouldn't be too disappointed to let that, to let them go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there were some links at some point this week, and and I don't tend to go into the transfer gossip too much, just because I think, especially at this point, it's all kind of garbage. But um, yeah, you know, we are now seeing our midfielders potentially linked to going away, JWP and and, and Hoiberg, and mm. if one of those guys goes, you know, how I guess how how how, how big of an impact is that for us? I think that was one of the places where you look at us, you know, right now where you're kind of running with just three guys in there, really with Romeo in the mix and, mm. you know, maybe small bone as well, but, but really, yeah. you know, I wouldn't want to see either one of those guys go really in terms of, of JWP or, or Hoiberg. No, I think Hoiberg's tricky one because his contract expires next summer. And also if you don't play football before maybe end of this summer, you're going to have to try and calm down, but he's going to, he's an ambitious player. He's going to want, Champions League rugby football where he had it fine so maybe we'll have to, to lose him for 30, 40 million I don't know what he'd go for in the, the market now but I think if we did lose him it it would be not easier but more straightforward to replace than, than Prowse because Prowse offers something a lot different he, he's good at set pieces free kicks corners penalties he's a, bit, he's a good leader as well so he could easily be a captain so I think he's come through the academy as well so I think he, he'd be a bigger loss in my opinion if we were to lose him yeah, I I don't know what what Hoiberg's uh Hoiberg would go for in the market, and I'm just gonna take a second to look at his his worth on on transfer market, which is obviously not the most official thing, but mm. that's what we use. Let's see, let's see, let's see. His current market value for him right now is thirteen thirteen point two million um, wow. dollars. Looks like so he's dropped off wow. a little bit from the the height of sixteen and a half, which I mean if that's all we're going to get for him and not saying that that's, that is what we're going to get for him. But if that's, if that's, that's what we're looking at. Like, I don't think that's enough to, to let him go, you know? Um, Cause you, you think no. about what you're going to get in return and, and granted all of this could change because of uh, just the coronavirus and, and what like finances may look a lot different after, uh, after this is all over and, and values may change a lot. But um, I just think, man, like, as the captain of of the team at this point and a guy who has been criticized for his play, maybe his play hasn't been up to, to par this year in terms of, of, you know, goals and things like that. But he is, he is still the captain. He is the, the guy that, that runs and runs and runs and runs the field. And he's played a lot of passes in the final third and things like that, even though they haven't turned into assists. But um, I think to lose him for something like that, you can't, you, you won't be able to replace him, I guess. And, uh, that'll take that'll take time to 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 sort out, but um, like you said, losing James Ward Prowse also would be a, a huge a huge blow, and I can't imagine I can't imagine doing that either. I just don't think that um, I don't know, man. I just don't think that that that'd be what we what we want in terms of of having to replace our our midfield like that. Um, but yeah, Ward yeah, Prowse, cool. by the way, uh, valued fifteen point nine five million dollars, so uh, okay. about, about the same. So I guess, given that they're both about the same, would you would you say Hoiberg's got to go versus Ward Prowse? I think so. Yeah, I think well, realistically, where's Ward Prowse going to go and start every week? That's a, that's a thing. Whereas Hoiberg probably could start at most top teams. I think it'd be perfect for someone like Arsenal, even Tottenham. But whereas Ward Prowse, I don't I don't see them going for that sort of player. Um, I just think that Ward Prowse, I'd rather keep Ward Prowse than Hoiberg, to be honest. Um, as good a player as Holberg is, it's just sort of a scenario as well with the contract. It's just the one I see you got more likely to go as well. Yeah, I guess I guess that's that, that is true. Um, in Ward Prowse, still kind of a little bit more of the you would consider him, I guess, a bit more of a luxury player. Like if, if he's being looked at by a lot of places, they would not say he's 
he's going to be the if you're going to play him at a two, maybe I think a lot of a lot of people wouldn't do it, even though he's obviously doing it for us. But I I I wouldn't want to see him go anywhere. Um, so that's that's it. Um, any other players that you uh you'd like to discuss in in this portion? I think someone like not not selfish, but we need we need to tie um Danny Ings down. I think this year he's proved just how big and key a player he is. He's got ridiculous amount of goals, one of the top scorers in the league, and I always I've always liked him even when he was at Burnley and Liverpool as well. I think we need to try and tie him down to a new contract and hopefully just because teams will be interested in him after the season, so hopefully we just get him sorted down and keep him get the club for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think maybe the we've spoken about it before, but one of the most devastating things about this is the fact that the Euros are moved means that it's going to give players like Kane and stuff time to get healthy, which means that there's less of a less of a chance that Ings will get a call up for for the Euros, and and that sucks. That 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 is a, but at the same time, uh, maybe it just gives him a little bit more motivation to do it again, do it again next year. And I don't know if you follow him or his trainer trainer's name is uh, Alex Parsons um, on, on Instagram, but they, uh, I mean, he's doing a lot of extra work and, and things like that. And they, he, you know, I've said it before, but he's had him out in, in LA over the summer and things like that. And uh, just a real pleasure to watch those two work um, because he's got him doing, uh, he's got him working well, he's got him healthy. And, and uh, something that I, I, I like to see Danny Ings healthy because obviously it means goals for us once we start playing. Yeah, I understand. Agree. Uh, you had a, a weird season, first season here. Um, a lot of a lot of injuries and stuff, but this year he's just been incredible and definitely our player of the season. So I think it's imperative that we keep him and that you'd like to think he would want to stay, given that he's a Saints fan as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess just one more player I'll ask you about. Um, che Adams. Um, I mean, what do we what do we do with him at this point? I mean, one season into it, they've potentially gone the entire season without scoring. Um, you just you just write it off and say we'll start again next season. I think so, yeah. I think it's very harsh to get rid of him. Maybe a loan deal, maybe. But then he's back in the championship where he was before banging the goals in. So I think it's a difficult one, really. And I don't know, it's just it's a bit like a bit unlucky, really. He had a few really close chances last season. You've got to remember, as I, he did lay on a couple of key assists. The one against Villa, the Armstrong, the Costrell Bull, and then again for Ings at Leicester, that was. But he, has, he has made a bit of an impact, but it's not maybe scoring goals. Um, all right, well, let's move on to some, some listener questions then, if that's all right. You know, I, we answer, or we usually ask for questions uh, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and then the patrons also have uh, an extra opportunity to do that. Uh, I have a couple questions from Southampton News Now. Uh, I believe they came in from Instagram. It says, um, first of all, how are you both coping without football? So, so, Tom, how are you doing without just football in general? Surprisingly, I'm actually right. I'm not, I'm not too bad. I'm coping a li- pretty well, in considering I've it's involved in my life so much and um, the old games and highlights keep me through it and a few weeks ago there was obviously we talked about the Inter Milan one and the Portsmouth games for the club replay so that's keeping me going a little bit but I think if it does last into sort of June and July I will really struggle to be honest because the longest yeah. I ever go is what, the, the summer there's not even like any sport it's not like it's just not football there's no sport at all but it's, it's very challenging but I'm getting through it um, that kind of rolls nicely into uh, Alan Guns, uh, who runs social media for St. Mary's Musings. He's at A underscore Gunsy on, on Twitter. He says, I want to know what's the worst thing you've watched on any streaming site all the way through just to pass the time. Uh, so what's the worst thing you've watched during this, uh, this quarantine time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I watched, I don't, it's quite an old one, but I watched this thing called Fuller House. I don't know if you've heard of it, but I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't really get into it, and it's it's just a bit weird. It's, a, it's about um, but the house in uh, with the Fuller House cast members and stuff like that. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah Fuller House. Yeah, that was not good. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I don't know. I watched it. Really. I, I heard people saying it was bad anyway. So I don't really know. I watched it, but I haven't watched many bad things to be honest. A lot of people have been saying to get into sort of money heist, which I haven't quite got into yet, but I do plan to watch that. I, I mean, I normally don't watch anything. Um. Mm. on TV other than sports and it's a very specific timeline in terms of, you know, it's usually early in the morning and I watch saints and then I kind of shut it off or I have other games on as I'm, as I'm walking around the house, but I don't really watch them that closely. Um, but I'd say that the worst thing I watched, uh, I was in you know, my allergies were kind of 
getting to me the other day, so I was I was like in bed most of the day, and I, I watched uh, I watched some replays of the Champions League, which were not bad; they were very good. Um, but then I also watched a, a full ZZ Top um, documentary. I don't know if you know who ZZ Top is. Mm, rings a bell, but I'm not sure. So they're like a they're they were they're called the Little Old Man from Texas. So they're this band that that formed. Uh, you know, kind of in the seventies, uh, they've, they've gone on 50 years uh, of being together. Um, and it's my dad's favorite band. I've seen them in concert like five times. Uh, but I watched the full documentary of them and, and it, you know, it, it wasn't terrible, but it's other than Ant-Man and Wasp, uh, probably the worst thing that I've watched just because there was, uh, yeah. like, I mean, I have all of Netflix available to me and I chose to watch that, which <laughs> It's not my favorite band. It's not a band that I know nothing about. Like I probably didn't need to to go there, but but I did. Yeah. Um, you know, and I I was hoping to be able to talk to my dad about it and get him excited, but um, he doesn't have Netflix and uh-huh. way to go. So uh, that that there's that. But anyway, back to Southampton news. Now uh, they they asked another question. And said uh, if you can pick only two positions to strengthen in the summer, presuming the window goes ahead. Uh, what positions are you choosing? So we don't need names or anything like that, but um, if you had to tr- just strengthen two positions, so, um, you know, uh, wh- where would you go, first of all, with your with your first pick? Uh, for me, it's got to be centre-back. I mentioned earlier about getting rid of uh, Hoyt and Vestergaard. And also, I don't think Danzo will sign a contract with us in both play this year, so I think that would leave us very light on the ground in centre-back positions. Maybe promote some of the youth players, but I think we do need to sign a, a centre-back of some, some kind and challenge Bednarak and Stevens because they've both been very comfortable and know they're going to play sort of every week so that'd be the first one yeah yeah I, I think center back obviously has to be a, a position that you you strengthen I think that's been a hole for us for several seasons now mm. um you know really since since Font and Van Dyke that partnership yeah. s- ceased to exist I think we've we've uh that that's been a that's been a hole um, I think that's part of the reason we had three center backs playing for a long time because it was just kind of, you know, you, you hope to strengthen just using the numbers, but didn't obviously didn't work. Um, and not, not to criticize, you know, Ben Rack or Stevens cause they've been playing well, but uh, you can't rely on those two guys staying healthy. Um, and then having to bring in a guy like Vestergaard or something like that, or potentially hoot if he comes back from loan. I don't think that, I don't think that works. Um, now, where, where else would you, would you strengthen? Um, I think I'd, I'd look, I'd look at left back. I, I worry, I worry if Bertrand did get injured. Um, he, he's still a great player, obviously, but he's, he's getting, it might be either hit 30 or getting towards 30. And, um, Logan's, when I've seen him play, he's decent, but I think he needs a loan. So I think even if it's just like a, a short term deal with someone or a free agent, um, someone just to cover Bertrand and have the faith that if he does get injured or pick up a red card or something, that we have got some backup. Yeah, yeah. Well, even Ralph has mentioned that the Vulcans isn't quite ready. Um, so you, you do need. We are light there. It's just fullback in general. We've been struggling to to kind of get there, and we've seen us play people out of position, whether it's Ward Prowse at right back or Danzo at right back or left back or wherever. It's just you know that when when we've got, when we've done that, you can see the difference in the team because the team just isn't as strong um, without those fullbacks really pressing forward. And and um, really, I I think it, it the the formation we play, we require a lot out of them in terms of getting forward and and rely and kind of contributing to the attack, and then also being able to track back. And um, without them, yeah, I, I, we'd be in trouble whenever we have a, you know, I don't want Danzo at right back or left back or really kind of anywhere. Just if I'm being completely honest, um, but there you go. All right, Luke Millard, last last couple of questions he put in a couple here he's another patron of the show and uh, just in case people don't know if you enjoy the show want to support it you can do that at patreon.com forward slash sfc delivery by doing that you get a little you get a couple of extra episodes uh you get priority for having your questions answered uh and uh you can join the chat with us if you want although lately it's just been me complaining about the dog uh who is will not bark today because his jaw is broken i didn't do it um but there you go and uh so uh luke says you're stuck in the house uh, under lockdown with three current Saints players. One does the cooking, one does the cleaning, and one provides entertainment. Uh, who do you pick? Oh, cleaning. I think cleaning would be um, Romeo. He cleans up well on the pitch and tackles a lot of tackles and covers the defense well. Um, 
keep. Uh, I think for Cook, I don't really know many of the players that are, that are good at that sort of thing, but I'd like to think that someone like Bednarak would be good at that sort of thing, having been in different cultures and stuff and played in different leagues. So I think he'd be even more Cook. And the last one, that's entertainment. I think someone like Michael Opathami, he looks, I've seen him follow him on Instagram and TikTok and stuff like that. And he, he looks just the, the really funny guy and one of the, a lot of players say he's sort of the, the bright spark in the team and sort of keeps everyone going. Maybe moves to Gineppo as well, but I think Opathami. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, cleaning. Honestly, I just, I'm thinking about, you know, what I've seen in terms of pictures of their houses and things like that. I think I'd probably go with Ward Prowse for cleaning. I just feel like he's going to be everything I've read about him in terms of just being like kind of clean cut. Uh, what, what was it? Ralph who said, you know, he's the guy that you would want or no, who who said Puel or Puel Grana that he would, he's the guy you would want your daughter to date basically. Like I'll take him for cleaning. Um, yeah. I don't know who said that. And I probably just, whatever. Um, so I'll take Ward Prowse for cleaning in terms of cooking, maybe Bertrand. Uh, I don't know if he can cook, but I think, um, I just think, He's going to, I don't know. I'll take Bertrand. I'll just leave it at that. I'm trying to think back to, to who they had on the cooking thing uh, a while ago when they did that on YouTube for, for, for the Saints channel. But um, uh, yeah. I think it was a bit of a mess. Uh, but I'll take yeah, Bertrand for that. And then entertainment, I'll go just go with Redmond. Um, yeah. His, his TikTok uh, stuff has been, has been funny. I don't follow TikTok, but it, all you have to do on the internet is just have one account because people will repost everything everywhere. And um, he's made me laugh. Uh, a ton of time. So I'll, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take that. And that way we don't overlap players. Um, but yeah. And I, I don't think I can go with a guy like, uh, like, I don't know, a, a Polish food. If you go with Bednarak, maybe that, that could be dangerous. Um, yeah, it could be. I just thought about him playing like different leagues and stuff. I'd, yeah. That's, that's a good point actually. Yeah. I couldn't really play that. <laughs> and then, you know, if you pick Junepo, that could be, I mean, I, I'm all down for trying things. In fact, um, you know, I think, you guys over there eat a lot more like curry than we do. Um, mm. I had never had Thai food until like a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've right. never, I've had Indian food once. It was like one of the things I wanted to do when I came to um, England was make sure I have Indian food. Um, and so I'm actually making a curry tonight. Uh, I won't go full. Uh, do you, do you follow? Um, I think it's Steve Forbes. Is that his name? Uh, on Instagram. Do you follow that guy? No, I don't know. He, he works for the club in terms of just match day uh, stuff. Um, but he's been doing this cooking with Forbesy. Uh, it's quite, you know, he does a really good job. Uh, I almost did a cooking with me last night where basically I just put hamburgers on the grill and drank a bunch of white wine. Um, but I decided my wife was like, you shouldn't post that. So I didn't. Um, so she, it's, it's good for her. She's, she watches out for me, but, uh, I'll, I'll have to let you know personally how it goes. Cause maybe people don't care. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully I, I don't, uh, don't totally screw this up, but the chicken's in there in the marinade and everything. And so hopefully it's, uh, hopefully it comes out all right. Yeah, sounds good. All right, man. But um, I don't know. Anything else you want to add before we before we head off? And I appreciate your time again. Um, thanks for just to reiterate what everyone says, really. Just make sure you stick to the guidelines and listen to the government advice and continue to stay safe in the, sh- in the short term and hopefully be back very soon. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask you one more thing. If there was something that you've seen or listened to or read over the break that you think other people may enjoy, like what would that be? I reckon a lot of people would have probably watched it already, but Saddle Until I Die on um, Netflix. Okay. I've really enjoyed that. Um, basically, Saddle Up in the North East used to be a Premier League club. Basically, going through that season last year, it's really enjoyable. And even though I don't know much about Sunderland, it was just quite an enjoyable watch. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I've watched the first couple of episodes of their first because they did it twice, right? They did the it, it, yeah, yeah. Didn't it didn't work out how they wanted the first time? <laughs> um, and I, I can say that even the, not being a Sunderland fan, and even though you know how it ends um, in terms of the yeah. first season, it's still it's still a uh, it's pretty gripping uh, television. Oh, incredible! Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I appreciate that, and and hopefully you know people if they have Netflix will uh, go along with that. Um, if you're really interested in learning a little bit about uh, ZZ Top, you can you can do that too. That's also on Netflix. Um, it's but uh, you know you heard me you heard what I said about it earlier. So so there you go. Um, but yeah, but uh, Tom, if people want to follow you on Instagram, they can do that. You're at tmaso19 and on Twitter yep. at tom underscore mason18. Uh, really appreciate your time. It's been nice to to talk to you again. Yeah, brilliant. Cheers for having me on. Yeah, and we'll uh, have to get you back once once football is back. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Yeah. 
And that does it for this week's episode of the Southampton Delivery Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Special thanks this week goes out to Tom Mason. You can find him on Instagram at tmaso19 or on Twitter, Tom underscore Mason18. Um, thanks to Tom for taking time to, to join me. Obviously, there's not a lot to talk about in terms of football, but uh, hopefully you got some insight into the League One and what's that like. And of course, um, Bristol Rovers play in the same league as, as Portsmouth, which is two leagues below us, which is where they're going to stay. That's good news. If you want to follow this show on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, you can do that. We are at SFCDELL underscore IVERY on both Twitter and Instagram. We're also on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash SFC delivery. There's no underscore in the Facebook address. You can find all of those links and more. The show website, SouthamptonDelivery.com. Um, links to that are in the show notes, of course. Um, if you want to leave a review because you're enjoying the show, that would be most helpful. Uh, if you're enjoying the show as, again and you want to support it, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash SFC delivery. There's no pressure to do that, by the way. Just um, it's, it's a good group of people who are over there doing it. Uh, I very much appreciate that. And uh, you should appreciate that if you like the show because um, they make sure it happens. So thanks to them. The show would not be possible without the help of a couple of partners, the Southampton page. They are at Southampton page one on Instagram and at Southampton page on Twitter. Uh, they'll keep you up to date with everything that's going on with the club. The logo for the show is done by Matt Beeling of the We Are Southampton page on Instagram. Make sure you go there and follow him at this point. Uh, he's running some some competitions, so you may be able to win uh, a couple of very nice posters that he's putting together. All music for the show comes courtesy of the Free Music Archive at freemusicarchive.org. The intro song is Epic Song by Boxcat Games and the end of show credits that you're listening to right now is Aim is True by Pottington Bear. We'll be back next week. Newsletter on Friday. Next episode out next Tuesday. And until then, remember that together, we march on. again.